Today, we will be covering the topic Membrane Transport Part 2, in which we will be studying passive and active transport. Cells employ various transport mechanisms to move substances across its membranes to be able to carry out its functions. In this lecture, we discuss the principles of passive and active transport and the membrane proteins involved in these processes. We also describe how carrier and channel proteins are responsible for transferring a particular solute or class of solutes across a membrane, thereby enabling cells to carry out essential physiological functions. The lipid bilayer of biological membranes is intrinsically impermeable to ions and polar molecules. Yet, these substances must be able to cross these membranes for normal cell function. Permeability is conferred by two classes of membrane proteins, carriers or pumps and channels. Pumps use a source of free energy such as ATP hydrolysis, ion gradient or light absorption to drive the uphill transport of ions or molecules and are examples of active transport. Channels, in contrast, enable ions to flow rapidly through membranes in a downhill direction. Channel action illustrates passive transport or facilitated diffusion. Secondary active transport is a different mechanism of active transport which utilizes the gradient of one ion to drive the active transport of another. The expression of these transporters determines which metabolites a cell can import from the environment. Hence, adjusting the level of transporter expression is a primary means of controlling metabolism. Pumps can establish persistent gradients of particular ions across membranes. Specific ion channels can allow these ions to flow rapidly across membranes down these gradients. This diagram summarizes the different types of membrane transport proteins involved in passive as well as active transport. Now let's look into passive transport first. We also call it facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport. Passive transport of solutes across the plasma membrane down their concentration or electric potential gradient is called facilitated diffusion and requires transport proteins which can be either channels or carriers. Protein catalyzed transport of solutes across the membrane occurs much faster than simple diffusion. Let's look at the example of facilitated diffusion of glucose and water. The human genome encodes at least 14 highly homologous GLUT proteins, and we call them GLUT1, GLUT2, and so on till GLUT14. All GLUT proteins are sugar transporters and have similar structures, but their differential expression in various cell types the regulation of the number of glue transporters on the cell surfaces and isoform specific functional properties enable different body cells to regulate glucose metabolism differently and at the same time allow a constant concentration of glucose in the blood to be maintained. One of the best understood uniporters is the glucose transporter GLUT1, which is found in the plasma membrane of most mammalian cells especially abundant in the erythrocyte plasma membrane. GLUT1 uniporter catalyzes the net import of glucose from the extracellular medium into the cell. The following diagram depicts the sequence of events occurring during the unidirectional transport of glucose from the cell exterior inward to the cytosol. Glucose binds to the binding site open to the outside of the cell then the transport protein in GLUT1 shifts to its alternative conformation, 
Glucose is released to the inside of the cell and GLUT1 protein returns to its original conformation, ready to transport the next glucose molecule. GLUT2 is expressed in the liver cells and the insulin-secreting islet beta cells of the pancreas. GLUT3 is expressed in neuronal cells of the brain. GLUT4 is expressed only in fat and muscle cells, the cells that respond to insulin by increasing the uptake of glucose, thereby removing glucose from the blood. In the absence of insulin, GLUT4 resides in the intracellular membrane, not the plasma membrane, and is unable to facilitate glucose uptake from the extracellular fluid, resulting in type 2 diabetes, a disease marked by continuously high blood glucose. GLUT5 is the only GLUT protein with high specificity to fructose. Its principal site of expression is the apical membrane of the intestinal epithelial cells, where it transports dietary fructose from the intestinal lumen to inside the cells. Now let's look at aquaporins. Aquaporins are an important class of channels that does not take part in ion transport at all. Instead, these channels increase the rate at which water flows through membranes. In certain tissues like the kidney, for example, water must be rapidly reabsorbed into the bloodstream after filtration. Similarly, in the secretion of saliva and tears, water must flow quickly through membranes. Aquaporin forms a central pore through which water molecules can move in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. Since aquaporins do not undergo any conformational changes during water transport, they transport water at rates much faster than transport of glucose by GLUT1 transporter. The formation of hydrogen bonds between the water molecule and the channel lining amino acids ensures that only uncharged water passes through the channel as shown in this diagram where the orientation of the water molecules in the channel prevent the net movement of protons through the channel. As a consequence, ionic gradients are maintained across membranes even when water is flowing through them through aquaporins. Now let's look at ion channels. Channel proteins that are concerned specifically with inorganic ion transport are referred to as ion channel. Now more than 1 million ions can pass through one channel each second which is a rate 1000 times greater than the fastest rate of transport mediated by any known carrier protein. On the other hand, channels cannot be coupled to an energy source to carry out active transport. So the transport they mediate is always passive. Thus, as shown in this diagram, the function of ion channels is to allow specific inorganic ions, mainly sodium, potassium, calcium, or chloride ions to diffuse rapidly down their electrochemical gradients across the lipid bilayer and the ability to control ion fluxes in this way is essential for many cell functions. Ion channels are not continuously open. Instead, they have gates which open briefly and then close again. In most cases, the gates open in response to a specific stimulus. As shown in this accompanying diagram, you can see that ion channels can be classified into voltage-gated channels, mechanically gated channels or ligand gated channels depending on the nature of stimuli. The ligand can be either an extracellular mediator, specifically uh, a neurotransmitter in transmitter gated channels or an intracellular mediator such as an ion in case of ion gated channels or a nucleotide in case of nucleotide gated channels. The importance of ion channels to physiological processes is clear from the effects of mutation in specific ion channel proteins. For example, cystic fibrosis is the result of a mutation that changes one amino acid in the protein CFTR, which is a chloride ion channel. Besides, many naturally occurring toxins act on ion channels and the potency of these toxins further illustrates the importance of normal ion channel function. Toxins that organisms have evolved 
for shutting down the nervous systems of predators and prey. For example, the venoms produced by spiders, scorpions, snakes, fish, bees, sea snails, and many others work by interfering with the ion channel kinetics, by blocking signals from nerves to muscles. All these toxins cause paralysis and possibly death. Active transport is a thermodynamically unfavorable, which is endergonic process and takes place only when coupled directly or indirectly to an exergonic process, such as the absorption of sunlight and oxidation reaction, the breakdown of ATP or the concomitant flow of some other chemical species down its electrochemical gradient. In primary active transport, Solute accumulation is coupled directly to an exergonic chemical reaction, such as conversion of ATP to ATP and phosphate. Secondary active transport occurs when endergonic or uphill transport of one solute is coupled to the exergonic or downhill flow of a different solute that was originally pumped uphill by primary active transport. So active transport takes place in three different ways by ATP powered pumps, ion gradient or light driven pumps. Now let's look at active transport by ATP powered pumps. ATP powered pumps use the energy of hydrolysis of ATP to transport ions and small molecules across membranes against their concentration gradient. All ATP powered pumps are transmembrane proteins with one or more binding sites for ATP, which always face a cytosol. These proteins are commonly called ATPases, and they normally do not hydrolyze ATP into ADP and phosphate unless ions or other molecules are simultaneously transported so that there is a tight coupling between ATP hydrolysis and transport. There are four classes of ATP powered pumps. P class, F class and V classes and ABC superfamily as shown in this diagram. Out of the four classes, P, F and V classes only transport ions while most members of the ABC transporter superfamily transport small molecules such as amino acids, sugars, peptides, lipids and other small molecules including many types of drugs. However, some of these also transport ions. P-type ATPases are ATP-driven cation transporters that are reversibly phosphorylated by ATP as part of the transport cycle, and hence the name P-class. This class includes the sodium-potassium ATPase in the plasma membrane, which generates a low cytosolic sodium ions and high cytosolic potassium concentration typical of animal cells as shown in the diagram. Certain calcium ions ATPases pump calcium ions out of the cytosol to the external medium. Others pump calcium ions from the cytosol into the endoplasmic reticulum or into specialized endoplasmic reticulum called the sacroplasmic reticulum found in muscle cells. Another membrane of the P-class found in the acid-secreting cells of the mammalian stomach transports protons, which, is, which are hydrogen ions, out of and potassium ions into the cell. The structures of V and F-class ion pumps are similar to one another, but unrelated to and more complicated than P-class pumps. Virtually all known V and F-class pumps transport only protons and do so that does not involve a phosphoprotein intermediate. V-class pumps function to generate low pH of plant vacuoles and of lysosomes and other acidic vesicles in animal cells by pumping protons from the cytosolic to the exoplasmic phase of the membrane against a proton electrochemical gradient. In contrast, the hydrogen pumps that generate and maintain the plasma membrane electric potential in plant, fungal, and many bacterial cells belong to the P-class of the proton pumps. F-class pumps are found in bacterial plasma membranes, 
and in mitochondria and chloroplasts. The F-class ATPases are known as ATP synthesis because it normally work as reverse proton pumps. That is, instead of ATP hydrolysis driving ion transport, hydrogen ion gradients across their membranes drive the synthesis of ATP from ATP and phosphate. The final class of ATP power pumps is a large family of multiple members that are more diverse in function than those of other classes. Referred to as the ABC, which stands for ATP binding cassette superfamily, this class includes several hundred different transport proteins found in organisms ranging from bacteria to humans. And some of these transport proteins were first identified as multi-drug resistant proteins that, when overexpressed in cancer cells, they export anti-cancer drugs, thus making tumors resistant to their action. Each ABC protein is specific for a single substrate or group of related substrates, which may be ions, sugars, amino acids, phospholipids, cholesterol, peptides, polysaccharides, or even proteins. The ABC superfamily includes bacterial amino acid and sugar permeases and about 50 mammalian transport proteins like multi-drug resistance, MDR, ATPase in mammalian cells, periplasmic substrate binding protein dependent ATPases in bacteria, chloroquine resistance ATPase in plasmodium falciparum, mating pheromone exporter in yeast, peptide pump in vertebrate endoplasmic reticulum membrane, cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator CFTR protein, to name a few. ATP-powered pumps generate and maintain ion gradients across the membrane. The specific ion composition of the cytosol usually differs greatly from that of the surrounding extracellular fluid. In virtually all cells, the cytosolic pH is kept near 7.2, regardless of the extracellular pH. Also, the cytosolic concentration of potassium ions is much higher than that of sodium ions. Up to 25% of ATP produced by nerve and kidney cells is used for ion transport. And human erythrocytes consume up to about 50% of their available ATP for this purpose. So in both cases, most of the ATP is used to power the sodium-potassium pump. The resultant sodium ions and potassium ion gradient in nerve cells are essential for their ability to conduct electric signals rapidly and efficiently. Sodium gradient is crucial for import of certain nutrients like amino acids and also high cytosolic potassium ions and low cytosolic Sodium ions is required for certain enzymes required for protein synthesis. Now let's study active transport driven by ion gradient. Many active transport systems are driven by the energy stored in ion gradients rather than by ATP hydrolysis. The free energy released during the movement of an inorganic ion down an electrochemical gradient is used as a driving force to pump other solutes uphill against the electrochemical gradient. Thus, all of these proteins function as coupled transporters, some as symporters, others as antiporters. In the plasma membrane of animal cells, Sodium ion is the usual co-transporter ion whose electrochemical gradient provides a driving force for the active transport of a second molecule. The sodium ion that enters the cell during transport is subsequently pumped out by the sodium-potassium ATPase, which by maintaining the sodium gradient indirectly drives the transport. For this reason, Ion-driven carriers are set to mediate secondary active transport, whereas transport ATPases are set to mediate primary active transport. Intestinal and kidney epithelial cells, for instance, contain a variety of symport systems that are driven by sodium ion gradient across the plasma membrane. Each system is specific for importing a small group of related sugars or amino acids into the cell. 
In these systems, the solute and the sodium ions bind to different sites on a carrier protein. Because the sodium ions tends to move into the cell down its electrochemical gradient, the sugar or amino acid is, in a sense, dragged into the cell with it. The greater the electrochemical gradient for sodium ions, the greater the rate of solute entry. Conversely, if the sodium ion concentration in the extracellular fluid is reduced, solute transport decreases. In bacteria and yeasts, as well as in many membrane-bounded organelles of animal cells, most active transport systems driven by ion gradients depend on hydrogen ions rather than sodium ion gradient, reflecting the predominance of hydrogen ion ATPases and the virtual absence of sodium-potassium ATPases in these membranes. The active transport of many sugars and amino acids into bacterial cells is driven by the electrochemical hydrogen ion gradient across the plasma membrane. Now let's look at active transport driven by light. In the plasma membrane of an archaebacterium, Helobacterium helobacter, bacteriorhodopsin acts as a membrane transport protein. In the presence of sunlight, thousands of bacteriorhodopsin molecules pump hydrogen ions out of the cell creating a hydrogen ion concentration gradient across the bacterial plasma membrane. This hydrogen ion gradient is used to generate ATP when the hydrogen ions flows back into the bacterium through a second membrane protein, which is ATP synthase, as given in the following diagram. Now that was all about passive and active transport. So before we conclude, let's go through some of the major points that we have covered so far. Cells overcome the permeability barrier of plasma membrane to transport ions and molecules, which cannot diffuse through the lipid bilayer readily by employing special transmembrane proteins. These membrane transport proteins fulfill an essential function in every living cell by catalyzing the translocation of solutes, including ions, nutrients, neurotransmitters, numerous drugs, etc., across the membrane, either by passive transport, which is facilitated diffusion, or active transport. Glucose uniporters, equaporins, and various ion channels are examples of passive transport systems. Examples of active transport systems include ATP pumps and co-transporters, which are secondary active transport proteins. The malfunction of these transport systems or their corresponding genes is implicated in many diseases like diabetes, insipidus, cystic fibrosis, epilepsy, drug abuse, etc.